We are starting on part nine of our series on the nature and character of God. And as always, we want to thank Karen Sari of the Infographics Bible, the creator of that book, for allowing us to replicate this particular diagram. And as we look at this diagram, we also want to remind ourselves that God, his character, is surrounded and just full of God's love. That is why God's love is around the outside. God is love, the Bible tells us. And also that God's character, his nature, is permeated by his holiness and perfection as well. These, these three things are all-encompassing within God in a lot of ways. So as we look at God's patience, generosity, and humility, let's look at the scriptures right away, shall we? For God's patience, we will look at 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is really, really important for us. Now, of course, all of the characteristics of God are really, really important for us. God's patience is absolutely critical for us. You see, if God was not patient, then when Adam and Eve fell into sin so long ago, God would have wiped them away. They would have died instantaneously as, as they were warned they might do. God warns them that if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they will die. But God is patient with them, and so they do not die instantaneously, and therefore we have a whole human race, a whole human history. We have people for countless generations, and with each one of those generations, God is patient. We see this, of course, illustrated time and time again in the story of the people of Israel. But we also see it in the New Testament as well. And Peter highlights this for us. God is patient with us. And of course, that kind of begs the question of why. Why is God patient with us? I mean, God could wipe us away. Absolutely, he could do that. But also, God could speak the word that would command us irresistibly to obey him, and it would be so. God does not want mindless drones who must obey him. God wants us to have freedom. It would be like it would be like a father with an estranged son trying to force that son to love him. You could see a, 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 a twisted father trying to figure out some way to force his son. Maybe he would uh, blackmail his son, or maybe he would, he would uh, threaten his son, or maybe he would punish his son so much that the son is forced out of abuse to, to say, I love you, Dad, even though this is, this is not genuine. Now, God, of course, could change our minds and make it genuine, but it would be wrong. God gave us free will in order that we may love him freely. But in order to have the free will to love God, we also need to have the free will to choose not to love God. And this is what Adam and Eve chose so long ago. They chose to walk away from God, to disobey his commands, to not love him. 
And this is what the Bible teaches us every single one of us has done since then. But God being a God of love and a God of holiness and perfection, he is both not content to leave us in our sin, his holiness and perfection will not tolerate it, but also he is not content because of his love to simply wipe us out or give up on us altogether. Instead, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the working of Jesus Christ, redeeming humankind through his life, death, and resurrection, and, and the constant wooing of the Holy Spirit, and the work of the, the scriptures in our hearts and minds, and the witness of the Christian community, God works to bring us into his kingdom of our own free will. And praise be to God, he is incredibly patient in that. And that is what Peter is getting at here. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, not as some people understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, there is a heresy out there called universalism in which basically the idea is that everyone will be saved. Everyone will get eternal life. Everyone will go to heaven regardless of what they have done in this world and indeed regardless of what spiritual path they have chosen. This is not what Peter is talking about. We know very clearly from scriptures that there is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. However, we need to also keep in mind that our all-powerful, all-present, everlasting God, who is love and who is holy and perfect, is also patient and he pursues people up until the moment they die. And so if a patient, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, everlasting God pursues you with love for your whole life, well, you have to be pretty stubborn to ultimately refuse that, that love there will be those people who stubbornly insist on going their own way, on removing themselves from God's loving presence and family. And God will not force them. God will not say to them, you must be saved. Instead, if they doggedly insist on receiving condemnation, then they will eventually get what they ask for. There is also a thought among many Christians that the number of people who make it to heaven will be exceedingly small. That there will be a very small number of the total of humanity that makes it to the everlasting life with God. And that, of course, may be true. We won't really know until we get there. That being said, and this is not me speaking um, authoritatively, because I also don't know, but my tendency is to believe that if an all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God, an everlasting God, pursues people with love for their whole lives, determinedly, that probably he'll win more often than not. Be that as it may, regardless of whether or not there will be lots of people in heaven or a little portion of people in heaven, uh, it is certainly true that God is patient with us. <clears throat> God is exceedingly patient. And, and not only patient with our individual salvation, but patient with all of humanity. 
Take, for example, the city, state, the nation of uh, Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, which was part of an empire. Uh, take, for example, them. God was exceedingly patient with them, so much so that he sent the reluctant prophet Jonah to them to proclaim the news that they needed to repent. And lo and behold, they did. And so God stayed his righteous wrath and judgment upon them. And they went on for some time after that, having repented. Now, they did not stay repentant forever, but they, they did receive God's patience, a tremendous amount of it, as did the people of Israel we can see time and time again, as do we if we poke around in our own hearts and minds. But then we can also find out that God is not just patient, he is also generous. God is not a stingy God. This is what James says in James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, this is really important. God gives generously to all without finding fault. God does not say, well, you were mean to me yesterday, so I'm not going to give you anything today. That's not our God, right? Our God gives generously and without finding fault. He doesn't say to you, hey, Bob, you're not a nice person, and so therefore I'm going to take away every good thing. That's not God, how God works. God gives and longs to give. There's illustration from C.S. Lewis that I want to share with you briefly. In C.S. Lewis's book, the, the Last Battle, there is a scene near the end where a bunch of dwarves have decided that they are going to believe in only what is real, the real thing. And <laughs> they do so so much that they convince themselves that the, the character Aslan, who represents God in those stories, that that character is not real. And they do so so much that even when they are surrounded by the glory of eternal life and the beauty of Aslan's country, they have convinced themselves so much that, they, that it doesn't exist that they genuinely can't see it. And so it is with us and God's generosity sometimes. God pours out blessings upon blessings upon us, and yet we blind ourselves to those things. We say that they are just coincidence, or they are just the way that nature works, or the, they're just the, the, the happenstances of this world. Or we take what really are blessings and turn them into curses. We say, woe is me because I have lost my job, which, which is a hard thing. But we fail to see that there very well probably is a blessing in there, an opportunity for us, presented to us by God. What that opportunity is, no one but God and yourself, as you work these things out, can be, can, will know that. But that doesn't negate the fact that God has given generously, and even what appears to be taking away is actually giving. This is why we, we believe God when he says he works all things to the good of those who love him. If God works all things to the good of those who love him, then surely all things that happen to us will be turned into blessings, even if they don't appear that way at first. Now that, that's a really hard teaching to accept in the deeps of our souls. Because the reality is, is that it, it is 
almost impossible to say that the cancer that my loved one has is somehow a blessing. So we need to be clear. The cancer is not a blessing. The cancer is part of the brokenness of this world that we as a whole, as humanity, have brought into this world. It's part of the corruption that sin has brought into this world. Cancer, let me be clear, is not a blessing. However, God will take cancer and somehow will shape it into a blessing for those who love God. It may take a whole lifetime to understand what that blessing was. It may be a multitude of blessings, little blessings that we, we can't even comprehend. But nonetheless, if God says... He works all things to the good of those who love him. Then God works somehow cancer into blessing for us. God gives generously. More, uh, more obvious than that, as, as James puts it, we should ask God for the things that we lack. If we lack patience, for example, we should ask God for that. And God wants to give it to us. Same with wisdom. If we want to gain a heart of wisdom, we need to learn to fear God and we need to learn about His ways through Scripture and so on. And so if we ask for wisdom, the road to get it will probably not be easy but God will generously give it to us. So God is generous to us, and God is patient with us. And not only that, but God is humble. Now that may strike us as odd at first in a way, because God is all of these things that are so far beyond our comprehension. All of these omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and everlasting and Trinitarian, and God can do anything, and yet God is humble? But we see it in Jesus Christ made manifest. This is what Philippians 2 verse 8 says. And being found in appearance as a man, that is referring to Jesus Christ, of course, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let me read a little bit more surrounding that. Philippians chapter 2, starting in uh, verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, who is the very living word of God, fully God and fully human, Jesus is humble. And if Jesus is humble, then so is the Father, and so is the Holy Spirit. What a sharp contrast to human ways of looking at things. In our fallenness, it is so often true that we do not want to be humble. We want to be able to be prideful. And we are constantly fooling ourselves into thinking that we have a right to be proud of this, that, or the other thing. But Paul makes it very clear that if we are to boast, we should boast only in Christ Jesus. That we in ourselves are, are, are nothing 
without God. And Paul makes it clear here in Philippians that this humility of God's, where he would, this God who created and sustains everything for all of history and who can do all things, and is perfect in all ways, that this God would empty himself and become nothing. Becoming one of us. That this, Paul makes clear, is the mindset that we ought to have. The mindset of humility. So, God's patience, his generosity, and his humility. What do they mean? Well, first of all, again, we come across characteristics for which we need to be incredibly grateful. For if it were not for these things, if it were not for God's patience and generosity and humility, once again, we would be in deep trouble we would probably not exist. None of us would. And if we did exist, we would be in deep judgment and deep trouble. And so once again, we are found in the place where we must stand in awe of our God, who is patient and generous and humble. But what does it mean for us? Of course, again, these being characteristics of God's that we can have, we need to see God's example. We need to see how God created us in his image. And we need to see that being truly human, as God intended us to be, means being patient and generous and humble. Now this has some direct implications for us just as we live our lives from day to day. Patience, oh man, it is hard sometimes to be patient. To be patient with especially the people we love the most, that can be the hardest of all. But it is also the opportunity to foster patience, to learn from the Holy Spirit how to be patient with our spouses, our kids, our parents, or whomever. Not only that, but we need to be patient with ourselves, too. We are not on a journey of instantaneous fixing. It's not like when Paul was on the road to Damascus and he had that experience with, with God coming to him and saying, Paul, why are you persecuting me? It, it's not like suddenly, instantaneously, all of Paul's faults were gone. Paul even says later on that he considered himself the chief of sinners still. And that the things that he wanted to do, he did not do. And the things that he did do were the things that he didn't want to do. Paul didn't instantaneously become a perfect person. Indeed, on his deathbed, Paul was not a pers perfect person. The only being who has ever been a perfect person is Jesus himself. All of us are on a journey of the Holy Spirit working in us, cleaning house and repairing what is broken, and helping us to become what God always desired us to be. And so we need to be patient with ourselves. If God is patient with me, what right have I to not be patient with myself? Do I think that I am more holy and more righteous than God? Am I a better judge than God? Of course not. God is my judge. And if God does not condemn me, and if God is patient with me, then I need to be patient with me. Just as I need to be patient with everyone else around me. Same with generosity. Generosity is something that, that many of us are often quite good at, at least on some levels. 
But often we struggle to be generous with ourselves. Or we struggle when others are generous with us. If people give to us exorbitantly of their time, of their their gifts, their talents, their abilities, their, their money, whatever, we have a tendency to resist that. And, and some of that is good because we certainly don't want to take advantage of people. And we don't want unhealthy relationships and such. But there is nothing wrong with receiving generous help from others when we are in need. We tend to have this foolish, prideful belief that it is okay, indeed important, for us to help others, and yet for us to be independent and self-sufficient on our own. If you think about it, it's really a sneaky way of saying, I'm better than them. And that, of course, just doesn't wash. And so we need to be generous. And we need to also be generous with allowing others to be generous with us. We need to willingly and servant, in a servant-like manner give help. And we need to willingly and in a servant, humble manner receive Generosity is something that can be cultivated within us as well. And last but not least, we need to be humble. Hmm. I am firmly convinced that one of the greatest sins of the Christian church as a whole over the past several hundred years, including and up till today, I am convinced that one of our greatest sins is pride. For almost countless centuries, we have stood up and proudly declared that we can judge everyone. And it is true that someday God will make us part of his judgment team, right? But when the church loudly proclaims that the world is evil and the world is doing wrong, and meanwhile we have sin seething within us, when we see scandals of priestly abuse or pastors who take advantage of their flocks and bilk them out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, when we see pastors and and other leaders involved in affairs all over the place, when we see preachers and, and congregants spewing hate contrary to the very word of God and the most important commandment of God, to love God and to love your neighbor, when we see those things, then we see not humility, but pride and arrogance. And quite frankly, it is no wonder that many, many people have turned away from the church. Because in the church, they see people who claim to be good, who claim to have a moral authority, who claim to know what is right, and yet who have perpetuated abuse, who have taken over whole cultures, who have spread colonialism across the planet, who have have engaged in sexual scandal and who who have been corrupt in all kinds of power games in politics and elsewhere. We need to be humble. The church as a whole needs to stand up and humbly say, 
Look, we know that we have done wrong many times. We know that we are not perfect. We know that we are, in fact, no better than any of you. That we are just as human, just as broken, just as sad, just as messed up, just as corrupt. We know these things. And we are sorry that we ever pretended anything different. And if we take that step, both as a whole church and as individuals, then when people want to share their stories, we can receive them with humility. And we can say humbly and honestly, look, I don't have all the answers. I am not perfect. I have my own deep sins and troubles that God is working to cleanse from me. But if you want to know what I believe God teaches, then this is what the scriptures say. And please, don't hear me condemning you, but instead hear me sharing hope with you. That you don't have to live this way. That you don't have to be enmeshed in the sins always. That you too can have the Holy Spirit cleansing house and making things right. That you too can become part of the family of God. Brothers and sisters, our God is patient. Our God is generous. And our God is humble. Let us, brothers and sisters, also be humble and generous and patient. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time together. Lord, we are humbled by your humility. We are in awe of your patience with us. And we can hardly believe your generosity to us. God, help us, we pray. Help us to receive those gifts from you with love and gratitude. And help us turn and give those gifts back. Give those gifts back to you, even though they in no measure come even close to equaling what you have given us. Let us hopefully give humility and generosity and patience with ourselves and with others, back as an offering to you. May it be a pleasing aroma to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.